Hello everyone, welcome to a uh, brand new lecture, uh, chapter 22. Um, I'm not going to be using the uh, uh, webcam uh, today, it just I'm, uh, uh, I'm here on spring break, so I um, just didn't want to uh, dress extra nice today, so I'm just going to, uh, anyway, what we want to look at is uh, begin our lymphatic system today. On this lecture, we're actually going to focus on uh, lymphatic anatomy. Uh, and then we're going to look at the non-specific defenses, so we'll get into that, uh, detail those out. But as we start a new chapter, remember, a little more persistence, a little more effort, and what seemed hopeless failure may turn to glorious success. Um, as we look through there, remember, I do ask on every chapter objective, uh, the list of the 13 things there, and I'm going to be looking at uh, uh, stuff here uh, included. So. All right, so as we look, first thing we always want to do, usually when we introduce a chapter, we always give some of the main functions of a particular section, particular system. And the first thing we're going to see is, well, this uh, the lymphatic system, it produces lymphocytes, it maintains lymphocytes, and it distributes lymphocytes. So if it produces, maintains, and distributes lymphocytes, that gives me defenses against pathogens. What's a pathogen? That's a microbe, a microbial organism, a small thing, a germ, a pathogen, something that can make you sick. Okay, usually these will be things like viruses and bacteria. So right now, as everybody talks about coronavirus, uh, we're dealing with that, you know, COVID-19. Uh, so uh, these lymphoid organs, things that you deal with, these guys monitor and they filter a fluid called lymph and also blood. And in there, there will be pathogens, for example, virus, bacteria, fungal infections, protozoan infections, things like that, or cancer cells even that will be found in the bloodstream or the lymph. Uh, because when cancer cells, you talk about that in AMP1, I said when things metastasize like malignant melanoma, it goes into the lymphatic system, things like that. Now, also it returns fluids, lost at capillaries. Now, when we discussed uh, capillary action, and I was actually looking kind of quickly uh, for a drawing that I would have done in lecture. Um, uh, this drawing that I would have done, uh, and I kind of want to return to it, is you can see that fluids, uh, they are lost now uh, to the bloodstream. Now what's going to happen is, these fluids, there's a reabsorption. There is somewhere about 10% roughly. I'm uh, There's a variety of numbers you'll see out there. Uh, but there is some fluids that fails to get reabsorbed. Let's say 10%. It's not always going to be 10%. That number can vary. But let's say I have this value here. And if you add to that drawing we last did, and I have uh, here a lymphatic capillary, then this 10% of water, a fluid that did not get reabsorbed, would end up in here to become the lymph. And this is why lymph is going to be similar similar to the chemical composition of the interstitial fluid because it basically is okay chemically that's what it is okay so we are going to see uh, that it returns fluid loss capillaries it prevents swelling or edema now lymph is the fluid and it's much like the interstitial fluid and I know that's supposed to be uh, there, and I'm just going to go ahead and do that real quick because if I don't do it, I won't remember to do it. Um, and what we're going to see is this transports our lymph uh, as well. So the lymph itself is the fluid, very pale yellow, uh, not as yellow as plasma, but it is very much like your interstitial fluid. And that lymph is transported by lymphatic vessels called the lymphatics. 
Then the lymphoid tissues and organs that we're going to talk about. We'll talk about lymphoid tissues, organs like the uh, thymus and the uh, lymph nodes, etc. Then we're going to talk about the red bone marrow, uh, which is where lymphocytes are made. Remember, a red bone marrow has the hemocytoblast that can go on to become a myeloid stem cell or a lymphoid stem cell. And the lympho lymphoid stem cell becomes your lymphocytes, your B cells, T cells, and natural killer cells. So we already know that. Now, lymphatic vessels, they're going to be a lot like a vein, uh, superficially like a vein, but they have much thinner walls and more valves because they're very low pressure. There's a lot of valves to lymphatic vessels, and there are going to be a lot of um, uh, unique structures. And uh, so as we think about that, there's also going to be lymphoid, uh, so there are unique structures to it. Uh, there's also going to be lymph nodes on it. And throughout it, there's lymph nodes and there's various intervals. Uh, so what do you mean by that? You might find, uh, you might be going along and find a bunch in the armpit then go down the arm and there not be that many or hardly any at all. Get into the neck and there might be a lot there. Uh, and so just various places around these you will find big clusters at various intervals and they'll tend to cluster up. And then the lymph goes into your lymphatic ducts. Now we're going to talk about lymphatic ducts in a moment, so hold on. Now before we actually figure out how to get from lymph uh, lymph into the lymphatic ducts to the venous system, we need to make sure we understand how we actually get this. Well, first off, I always like to say lymphatic capillaries, they're like Hotel California. Uh, you guys may remember the Roach Motel uh, commercials for Roach Motels. Back in the day in a Roach Motel, it said roaches check in, but they don't check out. Well, remember Hotel California. Uh, that's one of those timeless songs that everybody should know by the Eagles. And if you don't, you don't have any class. And I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. Okay, just kidding. Um, the uh, the song Hotel California says you can check any time you like, but you can never leave. Uh, so what we're going to see is, is that it lets fluids that were lost to blood vessels get in. And things that leak out of blood, it ensures a return. So it lets proteins return that leaked out of the blood out of the capillaries from the cardiovascular system, gets it back to the cardiovascular system. And it's like a roach motel. Roaches check in, but they don't check out. Interstitial fluid can flow in, but not out. Okay. They're a little bigger, as you can see here. Here's a regular systemic continuous capillary. Here we have lymphatic capillaries, so they're considerably bigger. They end blindly. Here you can see this lymphatic capillary just ends. And you can see they just end. They don't open up like here we go from arterial to capillary bed to venial, on and on, right? Smaller arterial, uh, bigger arterial, smaller arterial with precapillary sphincters and capillary beds all the way from the, to the venial end of a capillary bed to venules, venules to veins. But these capillaries are very small compared to that. And they end blindly and then they go, all these come together to make your lymphatic vessels and the lymphatic vessels ultimately go on to make lymphatic ducts. Now there are two lymphatic ducts. Now anatomically we identify these later on and in lab. We identify them, but here it's just mostly what does it do. And there are two major ducts, a right lymphatic duct and thoracic duct. Now if we were to take a body, I oftentimes say if anybody's looking for uh, Halloween costume ideas in the future, well here's another good one is you get a body suit, paint it like this, and you become a lymphatic drainage, lymphatic duct drainages. The right lymphatic duct only drains, collects lymph, so this light green is where all the lymphatic capillaries would be located, and they're all going to locate together here, and they're going to be draining from the right side of the body above the diaphragm. That line right here representing the diaphragm, the, diaphragm, the upper half of the body 
on the right side. Uh, right side of the body superior to diaphragm. The rest of it, that would be the entire lower half of the body and the upper half of the body on the left is uh, the thoracic duct. And at the bottom there will be a cisterna chile that you also see. And I probably will at some point add that uh, to my notes uh, just to see it again in lecture. But right now, this is really all I look at. All right, so, and that's the inferior end of your thoracic duct. Now, if you ever block lymphatic vessels, you can get a potentially deadly, and it is, uh, it does kill people, it is a fatal condition called lymphedema, and you can actually see these two individuals, they have unilateral lymphedema. It is on one side of their body, so the interstitial fluids build up. Now let me kind of explain that a little bit here. Now, um, why this happens is as we look at this, if you fail to pick this fluid up right here, if this fluid doesn't get picked up and it doesn't get returned, excuse me, it's very early in the morning for me, if it doesn't get returned and picked up, then what's going to happen is this fluid keeps getting uh, build up. Uh, filtration is going to keep happening. Water is going to keep being put into the interstitial fluid. Water in the interstitial fluid volume just keeps accumulating, keeps accumulating, keeps accumulating until eventually it swells up and we call that lymphedema. Okay, The accumulation of interstitial fluid results. Okay, now the lymphatic vessels that are collecting lymph and transporting it are basically two types, superficial and deep. Superficial, that's in your hypodermis or your subcutaneous layer. It's under the skin. And there's a lot of things like the areolar tissues, the mucous membranes uh, contains that. Uh, things like your digestive tract, your respiratory, urinary reproductive, things like that. And what I wanted to do here is put that underlying there as well, just for future endeavors because I wanted to emphasize it's in your hypodermis and your mucous membranes. Uh, I always say they're strategic, strategically placed and fight invaders. And that's the thing you're doing here. Think about like your skin is a, a place that we breach our defense systems and our mucous membranes. Uh, right now, everybody's worried about coronavirus. Uh, you, it is airborne. You breathe that in from somebody sneezing or coughing, and that virus may get in through the mucous membranes, or people touch their eyes, or uh, touch something in their mouth. And that's where a lot of things, the flu. Now, <coughs> COVID-19 has, uh, it is spreading, and it is kind of becoming this out of control thing but nowhere near as fatal as something like the flu flu is far more deadly usually especially certain strains um, but uh, does it seem and some of these things actually spread pretty intensely but it is these things that help us fight it and that we always put them where things can get in the most think about where we get most of our pathogens we breathe them in and where we get a lot of like respiratory infections, digestive infections like uh, uh, stomach bugs, urinary tract infections, and reproductive infections, and those are usually STIs. Uh, those are sexually transmitted infections, uh, things like that. So places that things are likely to get in. Your deeper lymphatics, they are very large. They're going to follow the, the arteries and veins and when your, your pulse uh, helps move that. Now together they come together to make lymphatic trucks, trunks to go to your lymphatic ducts, your thoracic and right lymphatic duct. Now lymphatic tissues can fall into three major categories, lymphoid nodules, and these are basically just uh, lymphoid tissues that do not have a capsule. So that will be things like your Pyre's patches, uh, your uh, lymph, uh, your uh, uh, tonsils, things like that. Lymphoid nodules. <sighs> Excuse me. 
I keep yawning. And they're very large. They don't have lymphoid capsules. Uh, they have germinal centers where your lymph nodes divide. Your lymphocytes, rather, are dividing. Uh, now we have a thing called MALT. That stands for mucosa associated lymphoid tissues. So again, strategically placed to fight invaders. We not only have lymphatics located in mucosa, but we have the lymphoid tissues there as well. It's like putting guards on duty at weak spots, uh, kind of protecting our flanks, kind of protecting our weak spots where somebody might try to invade us. Um, might try to go in so we always put on some extra guards and that's our malt the malt if it's in the gut it's called gut associated lymphoid tissue or galt if it's in the bronchus bronchial tissues balt bronchus associated lymphoid tissues or in the nasal cavity nasal associated lymphoid tissues um, now your aggregated lymphoid nodules these are lymphoid nodules in the small intestines they usually like where I hear this is a pyre patch Pyre's patches, they prevent, like in the colon, when large intestine has bacteria that sneaks into small intestines, those could release chemicals that are harmful or cause infections or things that disturb digestion and other problems. So here we can actually see uh, uh, kind of all the lymphatic tissues that we, that we can possibly talk about. Uh, things I want to add more probably uh, for future reference. I'll kind of go in my notes and add some more things. Now I also want to talk about the lymphoid tissues called the tonsils. They're very large. You're in your pharynx. This is your pharynx. The space behind the nasal cavity, behind the throat, and around your larynx. This whole area is called the pharynx. Now, we call it a wall dyer's ring. And you may be wondering, why is it called a wall dyer's ring? Well, think of this as the pentagon of your pharynx. Okay? It's like the pentagon of your pharynx. And it forms a ring called a wall dyer's ring. The wall dyer's ring. Now, up at the top, uh, we do uh, have our. Uh, we have one at the top, two on the side, two at the bottom. Two at the bottom are called the linguals, two lingual tonsils. The ones on the side are called the palatine, palatine, palatine. And up here at the top, we have our pharyngeal tonsil and sometimes called the adenoid. Adenoid. The adenoid. So it forms a ring structure uh, that you can see there. So the palatine, left and right. Uh, so there's one pa uh, there is uh, one pharyngeal, two palatine, two linguals. They form a ring called a wall dyer's ring if you look at it from the front. Looking at from the side, you won't see that. Now, uh, the uh, how did I get? I, I have been having this happen a few times. Let me delete this. There we go. Uh, where I've been having some notes that I've moved around and edited, and I end up with uh, redundant slides. So I apologize. All right. Now we have a lymphoid organ called a lymph node. These organs, they have a capsule. They have a capsule. It's dense connective tissues around it. Uh, lymph nodes, remember, they're located at various intervals along lymphatic vessels. They have a capsule, the outer covering, uh, seen here. Those go in and emerge to produce trabeculae. The trabeculae emerge inwards, the collagen fibers, and they divide the uh, cortex into different nodes uh, into uh, compartments. There is an outer cortex who B cells dominate and then the deep cortex where T cells dominate. Then our medulla are here, med medullary cord. Medulla, that's going to be the core. The hilum is the little indention here. 
and at the hilum you will find an afferent vessel. Now I need to take the efferent vessel and bring them over there to really make this more accurate because it does not come and go at the hilum. Um, the afferent vessel arrives, lymph arrives, afferent to the lymph node, carries lymph to the node. Uh, efferent exits the lymph node, so it carries lymph away out of the lymph node. So exits. Afferent arrives, efferent exits. The thymus is an organ located behind the sternum. It is posterior to the sternum and it overlines the heart. It has a pink color. There's a cortex and a medulla. Now, it is, there is some debate uh, that is it bigger because the body grows or does the thymus actually atrophy? And um, there's been some debate about that. I need to look at it a little bit more and see what we have now. But children do have a larger thymus. Now, it appears is it stops growing and the body gets proportional around it and potentially not atrophying, not being, not, not degrading. Um, but we could have some new evidence to suggest otherwise. Uh, and uh, so, uh, excuse me, I keep yelling. It's been hard for me to <laughs> come in early on a uh, during spring break, but I just took I didn't take the week off anyway. So uh, T cells they mature here. There's a hormone called a thymosin that is produced. The thymosins we make what they call immunocompetent T cells. T cells become immunocompetent. They can they're competent. That means they can act normally a normal immune response. You don't want to have an overdone immune response or an underdone immune response. The last thing we want our immune system to do is overreact or underreact. That's one reason it always just gets to me when I see these things out in stores is boost your immune system. I said a, boost, a boosted immune system gives us autoimmune disease. Um, if you are deficit in key things that your body does need to fight infections, okay, granted. If you are low in key nutrients, materials, excuse me, I cannot stop yawning. Probably need more coffee. Then you're not going to be able to fight it. Now, think of thymus as like a general. Always says general thymus. Now, the general does not actually fight the enemy. How many generals do you know go out on the front lines and fight? They don't. They stay back and they order their people around. And that's what the thymus is like a general. It doesn't directly fight antigens. And there's what's called a blood thymus barrier because I don't want premature T cell activation. So uh, pathogens, we don't want them to get in and, and, and affect it. Now, lymphocytes, they actually divide in your cortex. Then when they are, they, they will then migrate in the medulla where they mature and they leave the medulla through what's called medullary vessels, so they leave on out. And when they leave on out, they can go out to the tissues and fight. Now, by far the largest lymphatic organ or lymphoid organ in the body is your spleen. Spleen, we know, uh, holds uh, platelets in reserve. Uh, that one third of your platelet reserves are hit, uh, held there but it filters or removes abnormal blood cells. We know this is one of the areas where after 125 days, about 120 some days, that a red blood cell, after 120 days, a red blood cell who's old makes it to a spleen, liver, or bone marrow, and the phagocytes destroy and recycles them. But it also responds to antigens. If you get Epstein-Barr virus, mononucleosis, this will swell, okay? And it releases B cells and T cells who will be found in the, in the white pulp. It also stores platelets. There is a blood reservoir here as well. And something interesting is at five months, this is where your red blood cells get made is in your spleen, okay? So the spleen does have a variety of functions to it. And I do want you to be aware of the functions of the spleen. 
Um, now, the spleen's anatomy, I'm going to talk very briefly. This is a lot, more of a lab thing, but I always want to talk about it. Is there is a diaphragmatic surface. It's very smooth, and it conforms to the diaphragm. The visceral surface conforms to the stomach and kidney, so the visceral organs. The hilum is the area where you split a arteries. <sighs> and splenic veins come in and the splenic artery and vein is what's transporting gases and waste oxygen nutrients and wastes red pulp uh, has a lot of red blood cells in it that is the cellular components found in the connective tissues and the uh, mirror of pulp is what we call the cells trapped in reticular white pulp is white blood cells lymphocytes and macrophages here also attack pathogens. Now remember lymphocytes. These guys are the second most abundant of the white blood cells. So they're somewhere between 20 to 30 percent of white blood cells. I'm not going to ask you the exact percentages, but I always do talk about it. But most of these cells can live for about four years in your lymph organs which is usually why after a certain time that your vaccinations will need boosters uh, so if you want to if you, unless you don't want to go get another vaccination you'll have to find and show your circulating antibody levels your antibody titer uh, now B cells they can stay in the bone B cells and T cells they're born in bone now T cell and B cell remember T uh, thymus that's my general. T cell is the cell that wants to leave home and one of the things they will often do when they leave home they join the army. So T cells they're the one that's the son who leaves home and joins the army and he's going to get educated and trained by the thymus. General thymus is going to train him. The B cells they stay at the brother the good brother stays at home with his family, stays where he's born back in his hometown, stays in the bone to mature, grows up in his hometown. Instead of, he doesn't want to go off and have adventures. He doesn't want to join the army, see the world, uh, meet interesting people, and kill them. Okay, he wants to stay at home. Okay, so what do we see? Is there are three classes of lymphocytes: the T cells, the B cells, and the natural killer cells. Now we'll talk about T cells. T cells, to help you remember the T cells, T cells talk to B cells. We're going to see that B cells and T cells talk. T cells, they're the ones that are going to go to the B cells. And so what does a T cell say? When T cell finds an antigen, remember that's anything that causes an immune response, he says, help me catch some. Help me catch some. Help, helper T cells, me, memory T cells, catch, cytotoxic T cells, some suppressor T cells. Now cytotoxic, they attack cells infected with viruses. Helpers, they activate other T cells and B cells. Helper T cells can go activate an inactive T cell to activate B cells and stuff suppressor T cells, inactivate T cells and B cells, and memory T cells, they remember, 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 I forgot the date I was supposed to remember, oh, the, is it the 5th of November, I think, I don't know, I forget, okay, that's my joke, okay, so memory T cells, they retain a memory, now it's important that our body remembers when we're exposed to pathogens, because um, kind of think about it the way I always think about memory T cells is this and I do use some stories to kind of help it make sense to some degree as to what's going on with the body now when I think about memory T cells it always reminds me of the great white hunter going off on safari in Africa and uh, after a failed day of hunting he doesn't see any big game and so they set up camp and kind of drinking his sorrows away and of course as he's been drinking his sorrows nature calls and he has to relieve himself so he walks off away from the campfire in the camp a little bit to go urinate 
and he sets his rifle down in a corner uh, up against a little bush or something and starts to relieve himself. And as he's peeing, he hears kind of rustles in the bushes and out, out jumps a lion. Grr, roar! And the lion jumps out at him. And as, he, as that lion leaps out at him out of the bushes, he grabs his rifle, he shoots and misses the lion. The lion, when it leaped, missed him and they both run off. He went back to the camp, slept it off, slept off his getting drunk, slept it off, and the lion went off to sleep outside, you know, slept with the rest. Next morning, the great white hunter wakes up, kind of disappointed with what happened. So this time he goes out and he sets some of his empty bottles up he'd been drinking and gets his rifle and he starts pulling his rifle up real quick and trying to shoot those bottles up real close, practicing his short aim because that's what really got him. That's, that's He got caught with his pants down, literally, and he didn't want that to happen again. And again, while he's do, getting ready to do that, he hears some rustling in the, in the distance. And he sneaks up and what does he see is that lion in the distance practicing at short leaps. See, you know, you might get caught your pants down, but the second time, I always say with memory T-cells, it's fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Memory T-cells, they retain that memory of something I've seen before so that the next time I see this pathogen, my body knows what to do. It's kind of like the very first time if you've ever been in a fight. Second fight hopefully goes a little better for you. And the third and the fourth, you know, it's, you begin to learn. Don't put your hands down. Don't uh, uh, don't do this. Don't do that. Uh, learn to you know block every now and again. Things like that. So B cells are the bone. They grow up in bone. Remember, uh, thymus T cells. They that that is he goes. So think about these guys. That's why I say the thymus. That's like the soldiers. A good soldier retains memory, they inactivate or activate things, and they attack the enemy. So T cells. Now B cells, they're bone derived cells. They are educated and trained back at home in the bone. They become a plasma cell, they make antibodies, but they get turned on by the T cells. And sometimes they about the B cells. B cells, those are those hometown girls who only date guys in the military. Because they're turned on by the soldiers. They're turned on by that uniform. B cells can be turned on by T cells. By helper T cells. Natural killers. Called natural killer cells. NK cells. Uh, they destroy abnormal cells. Like cancer cells. And infected cells. Other kinds of infected cells. Now T cells. Remember they were born in bone. All these cells are born in bone. Now, the T cells, they are born in bone, but they leave, go to the thymus, and they're educated and trained in the thymus. These are like soldiers. They left home, they went to join the military, they got trained in the military, and they're activated by the thymus hormone. So when they get their orders from General Thymus, then they go out. After they've been trained, they go out in circulation to tissues of the battlefield. Now, B cells, that's the people, they, they were born in bone, they stay at home, they leave for peripheral tissues uh, from the house. They, uh, they finally go off to do their thing, but they stayed at home until it's ready to leave. Natural killer cells, th those are kind of like serial killers who only do serial killing in their hometown until they leave after, before they get caught. They're born in bone, they stay in bone, they leave for peripheral tissues to go become a serial killer. Okay. Now the so as you can see, we start off lymphoid stem cells become uh, so you can become a uh, now do not worry about interleukins that make it. The thymic hormones tell them to become T cells, and the T cells can stay in the thymus, for example, or when they're mature as well leave, go out, and they can go do a variety of things uh, like attack uh, infected cells if they're cytotoxic. Uh, B cells can go on to make antibodies. Natural killer cells can go affect other abnormal cells. These abnormal cells can be infected. These can be infected as well. Infected with a virus. It can be a foreign cell like if you gave me a kidney or here, a cancer cell, things like that. Okay, 
So as you can see, T cells help me catch some helper T cells, help me memory T cells catch cytotoxic T cells, some suppressor T cells. Now B cells, plasma cells are one, but we're going to talk about one other in a minute. Now we are going to see, and we're going to end today with a uh, with this slide right here. This will be our last slide for the day. We'll go 32 in it. And this is the easier part, so let's go back. Make sure you guys know where we're leaving. Okay, so there are two types of immunity that you have: innate or called non-specific. Now, it's non-specific. It does not care what the pathogen is. Have you ever noticed? So, if you have allergies, you're responding to you're responding to an agent, uh, a pollen grain. And you might respond the same way. You get aches and chills a little bit. You feel a little achy, a little sore, a little tired, lethargic. Maybe you have a little bit of a fever. If you get uh, the flu or a cold or the coronavirus or Ebola or Lhasa. I mean, gosh, you know, if you guys know about Lhasa, uh, Ebola kills like 60-some percent, 60-some percent mortality rate with it. Luckily, it burns itself out pretty quick. These are hemorrhagic diseases. Pretty nasty stuff. They are terrifying. But your body, regardless of what you got, you always have those, they always say, flu-like symptoms. Well, we always feel like we got aches, chills, fever, things like that. We just don't feel good. We feel logy. Well, that's our innate immunity. It always works the same way against any type of invading agent. No matter what it is. If it's pollen or if it's freaking Ebola. Now, adaptive immunity is very specific pathogens. And this determ this is dependent on lymphocytes doing their job. And you only get adaptive immunity if you've been exposed to something. Like you've been exposed to this agent. You've been exposed to this virus. You've been exposed to this bacteria. You've been exposed to this fungus. You have to get exposed to it. Now, non-specific defenses, they cannot distinguish. They don't care what it is. If it's a cold, if it's a virus of any kind, you basically have those general things that you always have every time somebody's sick. Now, the physical barriers that are out there, very important components, they are physical barriers. These things, they don't care what it is. Their job is just to prevent it from getting in. It's kind of like um, the uh, a physical barriers like castle walls. It's We don't care who the enemy is, whether it's the Hun, uh, the Mongol horde, uh, or the Huguenots, or whatever the devil is coming at you, Viking warriors, or whatever. Uh, it doesn't. They don't care. They go against various different enemies. Phagocytic cells. They eat, if it's a fungus, a virus, a bacteria, a protist, they don't care. They're not picky. Immunological surveillance. Again, you're just watching for potential enemies. We just watch, just like when we do surveillance. Just like the CIA agent or the FBI agent that's watching you right now through your webcam. I'm just joking. Uh, interferon. Uh, it will interfere on with the spread of things like bacteria, viruses, things like that. Complement. This isn't telling uh, a bacterium, I like what you're doing with your pili. Uh, your uh, flagella look really good today. I like what you're doing with your glycan calyx. No, these are a series of proteins found in plasma that are activated to do some things. Fever. Fever. You pretty much get a fever when you get anything, any kind of infection. And inflammation. Inflammation happens from a variety of infectious things. That's a telltale sign of infection. Inflammation, fever, things like that. Okay? So, first off, now I will ask you guys which of these are a non specific or a specific defense. Stuff like that. I will ask that kind of stuff on test. Now, skin is an example of a physical barrier. Skin has sweat glands that makes enzymes inhibit bacteria, salt to inhibit bacterial growth as well. Hair protects us from insects and large particles from getting in. Those insects, a lot of times insects are vectors for disease. Some of the most deadly diseases out there 
are transmitted by an insect. Uh, some of the most deadly diseases in history, and one of the ones that I'm thinking of is was was transmitted by fleas, Yersinia pestis bacterium, uh, which we know is bubonic plague. Uh, there are many plagues, like for example, pneumonic plague. But bubonic plague was transmitted by by uh, fleas, um, and a lot of times animals. Think about ticks transmitting things like um, uh, Lyme disease. And I don't know if you guys know what goes good with coronavirus is Lyme disease. And so, but also think about like um, uh, West Nile encephalitis. Uh, West Nile virus is carried by mosquitoes. Uh, malaria plasmodium by mosquitoes. Uh, 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 African sleeping sickness from tsetse flies. So this is why we want to protect from insects, ticks, and things like that, and lice, and bed bugs, and other biting insects are great vectors for diseases. Epithelial cells have the desosomes in them to prevent things from getting through. Then there's mucus. Mucus membranes can also help prevent bacteria. Respiratory tract is a great example. You're all the other mucosa, remember nasal cavities, digestive tract, respiratory tract, reproductive tract, urinary tract. These are all the mucosa are all places you can get infections. Now phagocytic cells, remember nemophagocytes, microphages, they're many, or mine, many, many, mine, many. Neutrophils and eosinophils are the microphages. Macrophages are massive monocytes. They can leave, do diapodesis, and fight monocytes. They move around a lot. And remember, they roll around as they roll through the blood, trying to find a gap to get out. Okay? Now, immunological surveillance, natural killer cells. Natural killer cells, I like to describe these guys are like SEAL Team 6. And what does SEAL Team 6 do? Now, SEAL Team 6, uh, if they get in there and said, uh, have you guys, I don't know if anybody here has ever played any kind of like um, uh, Call of Duty game or Battlefield game, main mission where you have to do stealth. You gotta find your target. I absolutely hate those. I'm terrible at it. Uh, honestly, I'm always a going guns blazing, sort it out later kind of guy. Uh, but I always hated stealth missions where you have to do it stealthily. I just want to get in there and shoot the heck out of everything. But natural killer cells, they're very silent ninja assassins. They start off by doing, uh, they search and destroy. Think of them as quality control against cancer cells. Now, what they're going to do is, is they're going to go in and they're going to go around waiting and they're going to do surveillance. They're going to find a cell. This cell has abnormal, has abnormal proteins on it. And what it's going to do is, it detects these abnormal antigens, proteins on the cell surface, and it's going to come in and it's going to take it out like an assassin, okay? Like a violent assassin. So what it's going to do is it needs to first recognize that it's an enemy and adhere to it. Then it's going to move its Golgi into place. Now the Golgi, remember, secretes various uh, molecules, proteins. And in this case, it secretes perforin and that pokes holes in the cell. Now, coming up on the Ides of March, and just so you guys know, on the Ides of March, that's when they stab Julius Caesar a whole bunch of times. That's why every time I go to a restaurant and order a Caesar salad, I'm like, any salad could be a Caesar salad if you stab it enough. So if this was a cell membrane here, this cell membrane is fully intact. This cell's intact. But before now that you put a hole in it, the cell is no longer intact. 
and all the stuff comes out of the cell. Blah, 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 cytoplasm everywhere. Cytoplasm everywhere, guys. Will ultimately that cell's now dead. It can't survive. Okay, when we poke holes in it with perforin. So it's kind of like when you get in and you raise up, and you find the enemy, you get it behind them, you align your blade, you stab them real good, and you kill them, poke a bunch of holes, and that's kind of what you do in that. Uh, think of it like Assassin's Creed. I'm also not a very good Assassin's Creed player. I don't enjoy sneaking around. I'm just a, I'm a run and gun. I don't like sneaking, so I never liked Assassin's Creed for that. I do not like to sneak. I'm not, I just don't like it. Now, Interferons uh, is a type of uh, cytokine or chemokine. When lymphocytes get activated, or an infected cell even, they release what is called an interferon. Interferon, and I'm going to say regardless of pathogen here, and space that down, because I don't want it to just be, because, I mean, you know, it's, it's we'll talk about it a little bit. You guys will discuss interferon in micro as well. Uh, something you will discuss in microbiology. So as we do this, uh, they can attract macrophages. My chemokines bring the macrophages to the area, and they're like, I'll phagocytize you, and they're like, I'll phagocytize you. I can phagocytize because I am a macrophage. Okay, so, yeah. Okay, so there are three types. There's alpha interferon. Beta and gamma interferon. Alpha interferon is by virally infected cells. Now, alpha interferon, this is like Paul Revere. Listen, my children, you shall hear the midnight ride of alpha interferon. No, sorry, the midnight ride of Paul Revere. The British are coming, the British are coming to arms, to arms. The alpha interferon, when you're infected with virus, the virus is coming, the virus is coming, to arms, to arms. Here I have a cell infected with a virus. And this virus, viruses are absolutely terrifying because they hijack you. It is like invasion of the body snatchers. They come in, they hijack, hijack your cells, transcription, translation machinery, and they go in and they make your cells do their bedding. You now make viral proteins. You now make virus. You don't make your own proteins. You make virus for the virus. You now work for virus. Okay. Now, what happens is we can go in one of the cells and attract in K cells. Now, what is that doing? So, first off, if I'm infected with a virus and I release alpha interferon, that's going to go out to the other cells, and it's going to be like uh, it's going to be like Paul Revere, so that they don't get caught with their pants down. The first cell, this cell got infected. It didn't know. It didn't have its defenses up. Now, if you go warn the surrounding cells that the virus is coming, the virus is coming to arms to arms, then maybe this cell can do something preventing the virus to bind to its cell surface. And that's what a lot of this stuff does, is it can bind and prevent cell binding, prevent the virus from docking to the cell and injecting its DNA or RNA. Let's hope it's DNA, because RNA viruses are freaking terrifying. Now, beta interferon, the, uh, not only, well, not only do alpha interferon warn other cells, but they also attract natural killers. Um, for some reason, I, don't know, it was, I just I, I took um, I took uh, Monday off, and since I was uh, since I was off for a long weekend, uh, yesterday I watched the movie. It's a movie came out when I was young. Uh, uh, Rewatch it called um, Outbreak. Outbreak. I don't know if you guys saw it, but it's about a outbreak of a fictional based on Ebola virus, hemorrhagic fever from Africa. They called it Mutaba. But uh, the uh, thing was, they just knew it was going to get out, and they bombed and destroyed everybody. But they actually were using it as a, uh, as a bioweapon, and it uh, made it to America, and they were going to bomb an American town in California. So it's kind of also what's going on here. You're like, well... This virus, uh, all, uh, when you're an alpha interferon, this is the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. 
uh, thing going on here. It's Kobe Mo Kobayashi Maru for you, Captain Kirk. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but so yeah, uh, go search it. <laughs> go check out Captain Kirk and the Kobayashi Maru. But Alpha Interferon is also like that. Uh, it's that uh, you know you're doomed, and if you basically, when you release Alpha Interferon, you're uh, you're sealing your fate. You are warning others it's coming, but the natural killers will kill you too. Beta Interferon, this is a uh, release from a fibroblastic cell to slow damage. Gamma Interferon from activated T cells and natural killers to turn on macrophages. This means that there is an infectious agent around and we need you to show up and help me fight it. So, alright. So a lot of this is like waving a red flag in front of a bull. Now, compliment. There's more than 30 proteins that you find in your plasma. Most of these are made by the liver. This is why when people who have liver disease end up with problems uh, with infections. Now, they help, they complement antibodies to destroy pathogens. Now, we're not going to talk too much in detail, but basically what you have is there's some proteins here that are floating around in plasma. Now, uh, antibodies, for example, do, 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 and we activate it. Now, what we're trying to do is we can lyse it. Now, in microbiology, if you take micro, you'll learn this. If you, I don't know if you take me from micro. I will teach how all the three pathways activate the three things, like the membrane attack complex. When we talk about MAC attack, we talk about the big MAC attack, okay? Uh, lysing the cell now ops, uh, enhancing phagocytosis called opsonization or we actually cause hit, uh, inflammation through histamine release and that's all what it, ha it does now the interesting cool thing about this is is that you have uh, these three things like back, think of bacteria as very slippery they're very slick and slippery Think about a bacteria, it's like trying to grab a bar of soap when you have wet hands. So if we could put some sand on it, you could maybe grip it. So that's what we have here. You cover this bacterial cell in these proteins and it enhances phagocytosis. It's like giving it something to grip and it can eat it. Okay. Fever, give me fever. Uh, if it's over 102.2 Fahrenheit, we call that a fever. It can actually cause brain damage, but it does help mobilize defenses. But if it gets too severe, it can actually kill you. So then we actually want to bring it down and give fever reducers, things like that. So the fever can actually kill you, uh, though it does help to reduce uh, pathogen um, spread. And it does help you repair the body, mobilize your defenses, but it also can kill you if it gets too high, like 104 degrees, 106. That's pretty dangerous. Now, inflammation. What are the four telltale signs of inflammation? Swelling, redness, heat, and pain. Tumor, rubber, collar, dollar. Sounds like uh, dollar. I know. Now, uh, what we see is if you are a cell that's damaged, you make prostaglandins. Prostaglandins, remember, are involved in pain and inflammation because if you are, if you visit a prostitute, you may end up with pain and inflammation. Various proteins, potassium, who will activate your mast cells to release uh, histamines and heparin. This always increases blood flow. Uh, inflammatory response activates phagocytes. It makes capillary permeability change. Now, what do I mean by that? Maybe we talk about diapodesis. And I said that uh, white blood cells will just yeet right out of a blood vessel. Well, what will happen is, if these are the epithelial lining of a blood vessel, it um, when you come in with inflammatory proteins... Inflammation causes some of these cells to just constrict leaving behind an opening and when this white blood cell is here and it's 
Rolling, rolling, rolling. What's he going to do? Oh! He's going to yeet right out of here. And what do we call that? Diapodesis. Diapodesis. It yeets its way out. Inflammation alters membrane uh, capillary permeability. It causes contraction of endothelium. It does contract. Remember when we did that with blood loss? Uh, not only that, but it uh, activates complement. It is involved in blood clots. It increases local temperatures to, uh, because we already know that increasing temperature mobilizes defenses, accelerates repairs, and inhibits pathogens. And it activates specific defense as well. All this helps. So, what we're going to do is, is we're going to stop here and pick up next lecture with specific defenses. Guys, thank you so much for watching. That's a good chunk of material here for us today. Well, uh, we, got, we got a good chunk in. Uh, we'll go ahead and call it quits. Thank you so much.